Okay. And one more question. Mass Technical Advisory Committee. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see so many faces here. You're always public, but we can always see 20 people. <laughs> Never. So, they started at 2.32. Topics before us. If you have a business item, we'll have a presentation by a staff or a consultant. At that point, the committee will be given an opportunity to discuss it, and at that point, then the public will be invited to comment. Once the matter rests before the committee for deliberation, public comment. So, uh, I'm assuming that there are some folks in the room today that might want to testify. So, if uh, if and when that occurs, make sure when you uh, go to testify, you clearly state your name so we can get it for the record. So. Move to adopt the agenda as presented. Second. Second. All right. Do we have any discussion? Uh, Madam Chair, we have, uh, I would suggest, for the interest of time, that we hold off the informational items that we have before us. I know the obligation report is uh, not ready to be a discussion item today. And the other two, uh, just don't have time to. Then or get ready for that. So if we can hold those over to the next meeting, that'd be great. Let's work on the business items today. So item six A, B, and C mm -hmm. would be held A lot of business before you today and there are a lot of people here to testify this is a relatively simple matter uh, but it's an important one because at our last uh, in that certification review we had a corrective action that the ITS architecture needed to have a maintenance plan so that's what this addresses and uh, uh, it's due by January 1st of 2013 federal regulations require that all of you have an ITS architecture which is a, a framework to deploy ITS, which is Intelligent Transportation Systems, and also that we have a maintenance plan. So DOT graciously paid for our architecture in the beginning in 2003. And it was developed in sync with the state architecture highways architecture. And that, that uh, document included a technical memorandum that sufficed for a time for a maintenance plan, but they, they didn't really make any decisions about who would meet. In 2009, DOT developed a, an, a maintenance plan and it was really intended for the municipal language too. And sometimes I was unaware of that. I just learned that recently. So we're basing this one largely on the one developed by Telvent Faradine for DOT. 
and basically it just addresses who's going to be responsible for maintaining the architecture, and then AMATS is taking responsibility for that, along with, um, at various times, different stakeholders, and we may include individual agencies and uh, using a consent for major updates. The elements to be maintained are listed on page 6, and the schedules recommended that we're going to be doing a major update every four to five years um, in concert with TP updates. And, uh, update process, we will manage changes um, as, as things happen or we can collect them and just hand them to the consultant when we have a major update every four to five years depending on the level of technical expertise required. The architecture it's pretty easy to use in, in turbo architecture software, which we're going to be using, but um, there are a lot of dependencies that we require our consultants use for. So today, uh, well, I should say that I asked the technical team that we're using for the update to review the plan, and I do hear one comment from Mr. Bell Rader, who is the uh, DOT signal safety engineer. And and everybody concurs with his recommended language and she in this line followed by the line on the side of the language. It's just to clarify that <coughs> when stake when a connection is identified between two stakeholders, then each each stakeholder, each system should be responsible for making sure that their system is in sync with the other one. So that the person nominating the change isn't responsible for everybody's standards, that, that everything else comes up to standards. Is that, is that clear? <laughs> okay. So, um, and others on the committee, um, it's fine. Um, it's a little long, but we can streamline it as we, it's intended to be maintained as we go through the update in 2013. So, so we're asking the Technical Advisory co Committee to recommend to the Policy Committee approval with the changes submitted by the reader. Okay. Any questions? From the
percent. I feel confident that the work that would happen on either of those two uh, tasks, the MTP or the uh, Fisher Highway Plan, will not uh, go over the amount that we are going to leave in there. And I'm certain also that we will need the money down in the 500 element to continue our work. And this should make us, uh, so we'll, we'll go over that 110% by the end of the year. So uh, the request is to approve this uh, uh, amendment so that we can uh, send it up to the policy committee for approval. good to go by the end of the year. program amount with me. Um, again, as I know, at the end of the third quarter, we were at about 97%. So the dollar figure that we had in there was, you know, just wasn't going to, uh, we weren't going to be able to make it. Um, and again, that's in the element. So moving stuff from task 530 into another thing in the 500 element, you're still at your percentage. So it doesn't solve the overall problem. It may keep that particular task at under 110%. It's, it's the, the element that we look at. We can be at 300% in the task, as long as we're under 110% in the element, it will be covered. So that's why I moved, wanted to move money out of the 200 and 100 element, which we're at both at about 55% for the year. Um, the 510 task is, uh, I mean, it's, it's basically kind of the catch-all. Uh, most administrative work that can't be tied to a task is charged out of that, a different task can, is charged out of that task. So uh, the folks up in the admin group in the community development department, any work that they do on that payments is tied to that task. So the, the, the grant accounting, the quarterly reports that they help us with, all the administrative stuff with AMATS, whether it's getting stuff on the web, etc. all of their time is charged to that. Most of my staff's time is charged to different specific tasks, but Anything that can't be is charged to the 510. That it just it just usually heaps on the most. Um, the 500 and uh, the 530 public involvement that that increased a lot, largely due to some work that was done in the MTV earlier this year. In addition, uh, some of the other stuff that was done with some of the other specific tasks that got charged to that particular task. So it grew a little bit bigger than we thought it would. We, we, we try to get a good idea based on past, past work efforts uh, of what a task is going to require. Sure. We're, we're not always on the game. Okay, could you give us a, the, the committee an update on where we are with the minutes, since this is the task that pays for that? And it's growing, and we don't have minutes. Uh, the current status is basically where we were last month, as we had. Uh, a number that were in the process of being edited and I think seven sets that hadn't been touched yet and so those seven sets have grown by a set apiece based on the last month mostly due to the fact that the uh, secretary has been out most of the month with family medical issues so and uh, I haven't been able to touch them either so due to several work programs etc so uh, it's still where it is but Certainly my plan is, if I got these few things off my plate, I would be able to start on transcribing some of those minutes myself. I wish I had a better, rosier picture than that, but... Madam no, Chair, it's an issue as well. Uh, I've been working on this issue most of the day, and um, um, we're going to make an expedited effort to 
get the minutes caught up in the next 60 days. We're going to have additional staff uh, and um, um, work on the minutes that haven't been completed. Craig will work on the four or five that he uh, needs to finish up to get them caught up in this next 60 days. It's been a um, it's been problematic for us for quite a long time. Um, we tried to you know, outside vendor to do these uh, minutes. We didn't have very good um, submitting proposals at that point in time. That doesn't mean that we might not go back out and try to do that again. When we went from the private contractor to doing it in house, there were issues to overcome with, with volume for that particular person at the time. I think that those issues have pretty much have been worked out, but there have been uh, you know, personal issues with that uh, particular person of being out more often than we had really originally anticipated. So we're going to uh, still try to adhere to using the in-house person to make this happen. And <coughs> 60 days, uh, but at the same time we're looking at voice recognition software that may help us in the future, but the problem is voice recognition software meetings and transparent meetings work well at a one-on-one, -on -one, but not with multiple individuals. So we're um, working on the issue, we see minutes in the next 60 days to get caught up. Any other questions or comments on the UPWP amendment number one for us? Are there any questions or comments on this item from the public? Hearing none. Madam Chair, move to adopt the major amendment number one presented by staff. UPWP major amendment. from uh, state DOT is that they'll be the same as the previous couple of years. So uh, you have before you a work program which uh, has the budget which is essentially uh, the same dollar figure but just some uh, moving around of tasks in terms of priorities. Um, I'm happy to answer specific questions. I see some red in there that I don't think I should have left in there. So I'll go with that. Apologize. So your dollar figure is the same dollar figure as the previous year, but just the past year a little different. Any questions or comments from the panel? Hearing none, we are closed. Craig, does any of this budget include funds that are dependent on the bond passing? No, these are all federal uh, transportation funds for planning. So these aren't capital, et cetera, no projects. Any other questions? Mr. Uh, I, I was going to suggest that we drop, this is a small change, 20,000 from uh, test 360. I don't think we'll need that. Uh, 
Well, the the uh, the assembly uh, has to appropriate the federal dollars for us to spend, but they appropriate it based on a uh, I'm not sure what type of budget it is, but it's not the budget by task. It's basically they have a dollar amount, and their dollar amount shows we're going to spend this much on labor, this much on training, this much on travel, etc. So. Um, the, the new SAP program that I, that's supposed to be implemented uh, January, some time frame. So I, I was talking with our admin people to figure out how that's going to change. Um, my plan is, and I think her, my plan is to have this adopted before the end of the year. So we're not in a time crunch. I mean, in other words, if you want to move the dollars around here to there, whatever, that's not as crucial because the dollars that get appropriated by the assembly are the fixed dollars. Well, I mean, I think from my, my sense of uh, I think we need to spend a little more time and the allocation of the resources and principles is given to us. So I, I'm not going to support approving this budget today unless, um, and I would recommend, frankly, that we have a work session because I know Craig and Jerry could potentially be challenged with some staffing issues and how the, the, the tasks that we actually at AMATS do um, with the resources that we have, I'm not convinced that it's spread appropriately. And I, I was comparing 12 and 13, and there's some significant jumps on some particular tasks. And I recognize that some tasks are actually going away. So I think it's going to spend a little bit more time figuring out where the allocation is going to be, who's going to be doing what, before we recommend an allocation to the policy. Since the assembly doesn't have to worry about where the money's going to be spent, I mean, I think it's important the assembly appropriate the money this calendar year so that whatever we decide, we're using grant funds to support that after January 1st. So. Um, I think that, uh, from my sense, I need a little bit more than just the allocation of the money. I need to know who's going to be responsible for these tasks. And with MAP 21, I do think that we're going to have some, some changes. So those are kind of my, my thoughts at the moment. Chair, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Just, just for clarification, because I'm not having gone through this before. So the 11 by 17 holdout has the calendar year 2013, uh, 2013 table two title. And then, and then I've got this one. Yeah, so, so the smaller one is just the amendment for this year, which I didn't show all. The, the funds out here are federal funds that come to the city, and they could be some federal transportation dollars. There are some EPA funds in there, and there's also some, uh, the funds out of the TIP are shown in here. So all of those are shown out there for 2013. The other one is just affects only the PL funds. So that's the old one. This, this table says calendar year 2012. Yeah, right. that was... That was item. the other. That was item that five. Was the earlier amendment five. Yes. Oh. Five. Not, not, yes. Number, not amendment one. Okay. Yeah, that is amendment one. That was item five. This, the big paper is not an amendment. The big paper is a budget for next year. The smaller one. All right. All right. Yeah, I got thrown off. I got thrown off. I'm sorry. I get just you. Just yeah, uh, yeah, the amendment one. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Madam Chair, I usually I don't read these things. Oh, that's my counter. Jessica. Yes, Mr. Weaver. How have you gone through this before in previous years when you've submitted the annual budget? Have you done a work? Um, and submitted along uh, with uh, We the haven't the always done work sessions. We have done some. There's more than enough time to do a work session. I have no problem doing an in-depth work session. I think it's a great idea. I'm going to try to concur with Mr. Wilbur's recommendation for a work session. One of the things that, uh, that seems a little unusual is that only $20,000 is identified for contractual services at a time when staffing is, is going down, and yet the budget remains for staff at about $820,000. So it doesn't seem to pencil out. Um, so I think we do need more information about um, the, the changes to the budget and how the works, do, you know, like when I said, who's, who's to be responsible for what. 
Chairman, I think that's a good idea because I'd actually like to know exactly uh, whose responsibilities lie where with respect to UT and municipality as well. Uh, just as an FYI for the budget, there we did, we did have budget constraints this year. There was a position removed from the AMETS uh, section. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a reduction in services from the municipality because we have other qualified planners that will uh, step up. They'll take the responsibilities, be responsible for the <coughs> projects, and charge to the grant, just as in the other position we're here. So we have to do, we have to uh, take uh, what we've been dealt and make it work. And, uh, I can tell you the staff resources are going to be there from the municipal side, but I would like the work session to see where all the responsibilities lie. had been a 2010 to 2013 tip. We, in this particular program, what we're doing is making 2014 live. We had that as an illustrative before, but we're now making it live. We're dropping off 2010, so our program is now the 11 to 14. We're reflecting the decrease in federal funds in this, uh, in this program here. And uh, you heard the discussion before, and we've had uh, when we went to do the public release. So I don't think we need to reiterate. I know there are some changes between the document that went up for public review and this, and I think uh, Mr. Rudolph would be overjoyed to share those with you. Um, we have uh, received 124 comments, I believe, by the uh, October 23rd deadline. Uh, you have that packet before you. Uh, we received three or four comments after the deadline, and those should be there as well. Uh, in addition, uh, Mr. Logan, there he's in the room here, uh, who, as you know uh, from other meetings here, uh, is interested in this particular topic, and he took the opportunity to look through the public comments and analyze uh, them in detail there. So I included that in your packet too, because it's uh, not something I had time to look at them all, but I didn't have to categorize them. So those are the things that are included in your packet. Um, and uh, I believe uh, Mr. Rudolph will talk about some changes that occurred between what we released and what has occurred in the time frame. Thanks, Craig. Um, as Craig mentioned, there were two reasons for this amendment. One is to reconcile 2012 with what actually happened. And then the other ones are to reflect the reduction in funding from about $36 million, $24 million a year in 2013 and May 14 live. Um, when, we, when we released the amendment, um, with the best information that we had and our funding plan, um, we reconciled 2012. Since then, the end of the fiscal year ended. We know exactly how all that played out now. Um, and so um, what we had to do is go back and Fix 2012 to what showed what actually happened. And in doing so, that changed a couple projects in the tip. So when you look at this first page and there's a bunch of handwriting on it, it looks like there are more changes 
just because the changes that we did make affected a lot of the overall totals. So I'm going to do my best to explain these changes. And if anybody has a question, feel free to stop me. Um, I'll try not to make this too confusing. But basically, what happened in 2012 is we were planning to AC, which is advanced construct, borrow money from 2013 and put it into 2012, money for Eagle River Road. We were going to do about 13. If you go to, let's go to page four, table three. This is the roadway improvements table. So if you look at the third project down, it's Eagle River Road Rehab. In the red that's crossed out, you can see that in 2012, we were planning to spend $13.8 million and then borrow $13.2 million uh, for 13. What actually happened is that um, DOT um, fully funded that project at $27 million in 2012, <coughs> meaning that we didn't borrow any money for 2013 for that project. What, they, what we did do is instead, if you go down one, two, three, four more projects, it's the pavement replacement program. That is Diamond Road resurfacing. We were going to fully obligate that in 2012, but what we did instead is we borrowed that money from 2013, which means the amount we borrowed from 2013 is less than we anticipated, meaning that there are now there is now more monies available in 2013. So that's why there are changes. So that additional funds that we have now in 13. I added into Dowling Road, which is two projects down to that. So in the amendment that went out online for public comment, we had about $1.3 million in 12, and we were going to borrow $18.1 million in 14. Now that did not fully fund the projects. Uh, we still needed to find additional funds. So when these extra funds became available in 13, I added them into the 13 column. So now it's showing $4.8 million plus $18.1 million. Um, to fund Dowling Road to make sure that it's constructed in 2013 because it's ready to go. Um, there is still a few million dollar gap there. It's still not a fully funded project. But if you remember, when we come to you with the obligation reports every three months, we have de-obligations. So when we obligate a fund or a project to the current construction bid, those change over time. And that's why these numbers change as well. And sometimes they come in high and sometimes they come in low. When they come in low, we can use that money to fill in other projects here. So last year, there were a number of de-obligations. And it's usually $50,000 here, $100,000 here. We feel that those de-obligations, that we can piecemeal enough of that together to just enough fully fund Dowling in 2013. So we're not quite worried about the 2 to $3 million gap right now, because we think the de-obs will, will cover that. Um, and we'll be bringing those to you through the obligation reports to, to let you know. So um, that's the current status on Dowling Road. If you look on the next page, table three, um, there were just a, a slight change in the safety improvement program. We obligated a little more than we needed in 2012, so we just reduced the 13 amount. Um, but the full amount, the 585,000, is still available for. We'll just save that money that we obligated in 12. So that's, that's a wash there. Um, and then if you look at the bottom, the changes were in 2012, because we AC'd less than we thought we were and more money came to the state, we actually obligated $33.4 million instead of the $29.2 million that we, we thought. And so in the roadway column for 2013, we're showing an obligation of $19.5 million with the changes that are in here. Now if you go to the next page, the transportation enhancement category, you can see that in 2012 we reconciled the numbers. We thought we were going to be de-obligating some money from the Muldoon's Road project, but that didn't happen. It actually came out as we originally thought. And then the Glen Highway Trail Rehab came in slightly higher um, than what we had in there, about $6.7 million. Um, and there are no changes in the 13 column from what was out for public review and comment. And table five, the CMAC category. In our last meeting, when Craig was discussing the timelines for the TIP amendment and the new TIP development, we realized that in order to get this MTP started as well, we did the timeline for that as well, 
we need to obligate that money in 13. So that was not in this TIP amendment. So at the direction of this committee, we added that money. So we added $650,000 in for the LRTP to get obligated in 13 so we can start working on RFP doing open up board and uh, not have to do an extension like we did this year. Um, that's the only change there. And then the only other change is on table towards the back here, table eight. This table is outside of the AMATS allocation. It reflects additional funds that come into the area, federal funds, state funds, local funds, just to give you an idea of what other projects are happening. We used to put all of our earmarks in here, and you can still see them in there, but we no longer receive earmarks. So what we had to do was clean up the port project because that had not been changed since throughout this whole effort um, to reflect the current amount that they are getting. They're no longer getting any federal funds as reflected in the current TIP. What they are getting is uh, GF funds from the state, and there's a GO bond um, coming up for vote next week. So we reflected in 2011, 2012, the state funds that were in the capital budget. 2013 reflects the GF and the potential GO bond money as it gets approved. There's a million of that is GO bond. And then since the future is uncertainty on what they'll get, we put zeros in there. But their overall request to this to the state is going to be $350 million. So we should actually change that last number, the 148.5. We should put that in as 350 just to show that what they expect to cost and what they expect to be asking for is $350 million. Where is that Table 8 yes. on the very first column. Oh, thank you. There were one, two, three, four port projects in there because of all the variety of different funding. We'll get rid of that. We'll just have one for GF, and we'll keep it simple. We'll put port of Anchorage, intermodal facility improvements, and leave it open as that just to reflect the GF. Thing. So that's more of an informational table. So then if you go back to the first page, we'll kind of recap this. In 2013, because of the less AC than we thought we were. We reallocated money. We added more money to the roadway table into Dowling Road so that we can fully fund that project and have it delivered in 2013, which changed some of the figures in the 2013 column. Um, so that means that at roadway improvements and pavement replacement, those percentages slightly changed. The roadway, the pavement replacement changed from 13% to 12%. TE total still remains the same at 11%. And CMAX still remain the same at 13%. So I guess if you have any questions related to that, I can do my best to explain it. Oh, and it's my, my hope that this committee will use this version as purposes of discussion as we listen to public testimony, since this is going to be the most 2012 it is what it is. We can't change that. So. Um. Bart, I'm still getting up to speed on the new flexibility that the, the recently passed transportation bill gives us, and uh, whether you can shift money from one category to another. Now, the money that you somehow decided with with help from other folks in the at AMATS to shift to Dowling, could that ha money have on to any other category? Um, it could. AMATS over programs both the CMAC and the TP category, meaning that they there's more funding spent in those categories than the actual funding received. So if you look at silos of money, and there's TE money, there's CMAC money, and then there's surface transportation money. We use up the silos for CMAC and TE. We use all of that, and then we pull from the surface transportation to fund what's already in the tip. So you can use that money and put it into those other programs because we already do that. So how was the decision made to program it into Dowling rather than something else, especially knowing that there were all these public comments? Interested because we've already made a commitment to, to fund Dowling Road, and in order to actually get it constructed, it needs the money. Otherwise, it's going to be pushed back uh, possibly a year or so to get it built. So because that's the only project in the TIP that we've committed to doing that isn't fully funded, that's why the money went there, and we maintain the percentages that we had in the current tip that's approved right now. Um, I guess since we know that Dowling doesn't have the full amount that's coming, you know, and and the bicycle plan implementation 
accounts are relatively small compared to the roadway project ones. Uh, I'm surprised that none of it was responding to the public comment for more money and for the bicycle. And, and I guess um, one, as, as, as a public member of this committee, uh, one frustration is that there doesn't seem to be any ability to influence the decision you made to present to this committee, um, you know, it's it's, um, it's unclear, it's a little bit of a black box how that decision is made to go to Dowling rather than something else. Because it's like, and I, I guess it's our job to figure out now whether that was a wise decision. Right, and so as staff, Craig and I, we get together, we make a recommendation to this committee. And then you guys are the ultimate deciders. You have the flexibility to change our recommendation, but as staff, we feel that this is the best use of the money based on the policies and procedures that were adopted by this committee to fall on those percentage and to fall on the percentages that are already in the approved TIP. So when we put together our recommendation, which is this, it is just that. It's just a recommendation for this committee. So the public comment doesn't ever affect your decision. It just affects our decision. Well, typically we get the public comment after we've made our recommendation. Um, we would put this out for public comment and review after we've already made the recommendation. But because these changes came in, it, we, we stuck with our decision to fund Dowling Road as we did when we initially released it for public comment. Madam Chairman, and how much short, short will you be even after allocating this additional money? Will it be, how much will it be short? Well, based on the current estimate right now, which will change, it's about three, three point five million short. Mm -hmm. And the construction timeline for that project is? We'd like to obligate it as soon as possible in 2013, which is the current year that we're in now. Uh, we probably think March of 2013 would be ready to go. Just for clarification for roads, you're trying to obligate the entire amount because that gives you the cost savings. You're trying to break it up or move it out, but you can't start the project will increase. Yeah, you need to obligate the full full funding for that phase unless you're going to break it into an additional phase. You can't obligate just half of it, knowing that the other half is unfunded. And that's just that's right. a, that's a piece of information that people don't. No, that, that's a good question. And we won't be able to obligate any of this funding until this is approved. And this is a very long process. As you know, it still has to go to the assembly. It has to go back to the policy committee. So um, by that time, we'll know what the DOBs are, and we should be in good shape. Chairman, I just have one other question. Then, of all the reallocations and all the allocations, um, in staff's opinion, there was no possibility of shifting any of the money for uh, no, there's, I'm, I'm not going to speak for Craig, but concern uh, on the DOT side is we have money in the TE category for organization. Um, we don't have a project identified for that. Um, it may be extremely difficult to impossible to obligate a construction project this fiscal year not having the design already in place because we can only obligate the design phase <coughs> before we can obligate the construction phase, which is going to be significantly less the design phase. So not having a project already in place and in the works it would be very difficult. So adding more money to that category without a project yeah. And just one last question. Does the Dowling Extension have any bike pad components to it? It has significant bike pad components to it. We did ask um, our engineer, project manager, to separate some of the cost off of those projects. We have three projects right now that have significant public or bike pad facilities on there that we don't take credit for in the TE categories. Um, West Dowling, phase two. <coughs> That project in construction costs has about $7 million in just bike and facilities. There's a separated pathway, there's a, a sidewalk, there's a bike lane, uh, which means wide bridges, heightened bridges over things that we wouldn't normally do if we weren't accommodating for those facilities. So, thank you. Did you say there were other projects? Yeah, Seward Highway is one of them. Um, we are raising the bridges so that we can connect the, the path underway. It is the only reason why the bridges are being raised, and that cost for construction is about $8.4 million. And, that and then that's the Chester Creek Trail. Chester Creek Trail. Currently, people have to. Campbell. 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But that particular project is not part of the AMS allocation. That's National Highway System. National right. Highway System. It is another project that's in the tip. And West Dowling Phase One had about three point eight million dollars. I'd like that. So that's under construction right now. Yes. Um, for for the benefit of the audience and some new members of the committee, um, historically we haven't had these designs for bike. Uh, projects in place and developed, which is why none of the stimulus money was used for that. And, and um, it's been a frustration of mine ever since I've been on the committee that we haven't invested in that so that we don't confront this situation where we don't have a project that can be obligated. Um, so I'm not sure how to fix that. I would welcome committee members to maybe suggest how that could happen so that we have those designs done. Um, you know, who knows when there might be some additional money, um, federal or otherwise, um, including from the uh, capital budgets, that kind of thing. So uh, we really need to fix that problem, and it's something that I've raised in the past for a number of years now, and it, it seems like it's not a very good excuse that we can and should yeah, I'm sure I, I have one last question as well. Historically, over, averaging over the past five years, how much have we allocated towards these improvements for bike head? And are we within the parameters that, that, that we've established? Um, we are in the parameters. The parameters is to spend 10 to 15 percent of the AMAS allocation, which is currently right now to $24 million or so. It was 36. So we do a four year rolling average from 2011 to 2014, knowing that. One year we may obligate $5 million, and the next year maybe only 100000 just because of the nature of the projects, you have to fully fund the construction phase. Um, so we're at 11% um, right now, uh, so we're within, within the target, and currently we've been in within 11 to 12% in our tips before. And if we were to have added um, we were to have counted, accounted for credit on West Dallin <coughs> phases one and two, actually phase one has already occurred, uh, what would that percentage of the overall program have been? It's, I did those numbers. <laughs> and I took your sheet, but um, uh, <laughs> I know. So what's the number, <laughs> <Come on. laughs> Uh, and actually, I don't have, it, have, have the actual numbers, but I think it, it, it comes up to about, if we were to have accounted for um, an additional basically $11 million, not including the sewer highway, that it would have been about 21% of our overall program has been going into connecting trails. And I, I, I see that somebody staff appears to disagree. However, the raising the bridges on the sewer highway again and that's not even counting that. But when you look at the elements that, it, and actually the, the Dowling Road project is providing a very valuable trail connection to this community, and the cost of the road was significantly increased to do that. And so that's, that's just something that is not included for in and accounted for in that 11%, you know, just so that the committee understands and in and, and the audience too, that there has been a lot of work that's been done on, on uh, pathways under the federal highway program recognizing also that this is never intended to be the sole funding source for trail or for road improvements in this community. So, um, and as you can see too, it is one program under the new service transportation bill. It has come down pretty substantially for AMS. And so that's just the additional information. Okay, Bart, you made a comment about um, that you guys are concerned about being able to obligate even the million dollars because the project has been identified. <coughs> I know that there's been some talk about, you know, low hanging fruit or whatever, but federal requirements require a design or a very fleshed out, very specific. It can't just be recommendations from a plan, correct? Right. And more so, than just a design, it requires an environmental document, maybe. Right. Well, environmental process so, at state level. So I know that in the past, no, so far, they don't support me. We have, we have, um, we only put like $100,000 in for those line items. Now we're proposing to put a million dollars in, which should make it 
a little bit more, you know, more money to do some of that upfront work with and get the consultants on if that's what's required. I mean, a million dollars, I know, is not what they want to get to, but they the design, going through the environmental, identifying a project, putting it all together, and that is a significant amount of effort. Um, do you think we're going to be able to get even that much done with million dollars? I mean, who's, who is responsible for putting together the design of a project? Well, typically for these projects, uh, we work with the Muni staff, Lori Skanky, and our safety engineer and your team. Um, they get together and they come up with some projects. This is, that's how the three that are in there were derived from. Um, you remember that in 2011, or 2012, let's see, 2000, 2011, we added $100,000 in for each one of those to do a small project. Um, and over time, those have all increased in cost and um, one of them is on the verge of being canceled because it just can't be done with federal funds right now. Um, so there's significant problems and some of those not being fully flushed out, but typically it's the Muni and the state coming together, determining the projects, and then moving forward. And I know I read a lot of these comments and a lot of them had to deal with the bike plan, but we have two plans, we have a bike plan and we have a pedestrian plan. And most of the comments were on the bike plan. I mean, I'm concerned that, you know, you take almost a million from the pedestrian plan and move it up to the bike plan the next year. But that seems to be taking counterintuitive on helping that other segment that are mostly pedestrian versus the ones that are mostly bicyclists. So, I mean, I appreciate what staff has done in trying to find a compromise and trying to find a balance. And I guess. Um, a million dollars is a lot more than a hundred thousand until we can get out of process to get these projects identified and into the queue to do the construction. I'm, I'm really, I mean, I, I can understand what wanting to put more money in, but I'm not sure, as you said, that putting more money in will actually get the projects identified and ready to go. Um, well, actually, I, ha I have a list here um, through the chairman's file, and it, it shows um, a couple years ago we were asked to come up with projects for the stimulus, and we were never, um, we could never go ahead with them, but we ended up uh, working on this, and this is from the bicycle plan, and basically these are all the projects that would need signing and striping just to make them function. I mean, it's not design. It would still need an environmental document as far as a CAD X, which is a, an easy way to go through. But as you can see, there's 3.8 million, and that's just construction alone, and this is from two years ago. So, um, I mean, we're more than able to have things ready to, to uh, do. I also have uh, area-wide trails. Uh, there was a project done in 2005, which we started sort of chipping away at, and um, to do to finish all the priorities would be 10 million dollars in 2005 funds. So, and a lot of that design has already worked out. So, there are things that are ready. It just needs a little bit of work to get them out to bid. So, what's the what's the gap then? I mean, there's been usually like in a row you have. Everything ready to go, and then it's just like okay, we need the construction money. But right well, now we don't even ready for construction. Are they? We don't even have any design funds to get things going, like with with these ones. I mean, basically, it would just take uh, where are the signs going to be, what signs are they, uh, where are the symbols, and let's bid it and right. do an environmental document. But we've had a couple hundred thousand dollars to at least could have had the design funds. There's been other projects that have been proceeding ahead of time. There's one that they're working on right now, which is striping of Arctic Boulevard, and it's actually taken uh, over a year, and I don't even know if they've got the environmental done yet. DOT's working on it. The other one, I'm not sure the one that uh, Ms. Rudolph was talking about canceling, it may be because uh, we met with the owner of the adjacent property. He doesn't want anything 
to do with the project, so it's on the coastal trail. So that could be why that was being canceled. He didn't. He wasn't specific. But there has been two projects that have been being worked on. Those were the two. So those would be the ones to be able to move the construction money, or this hundred thousand that potentially never done. So. Actually, of, of the amount that is currently proposed to be programmed in 13 for TEs at a million dollars, how would that money be? Uh, the projects that are underway right, right now, what is the cost for the uh, construction? How much of that money do we think can actually be used now? I mean, I, I think the, the point that the Mr. Rudolph is making is that there's a million dollars programmed, and we don't even have a million dollars worth of projects to obligate in that point Well, we have. 3.8 million right here. All we have to do is work on some drawings, and we're ready to go. But in, with all due respect, they each require uh, each project, whether it's the number of locations or just a single project, requires an environmental document, and it does require a drawing, and it requires allocation of staff time and resources. Mm -hmm. And and there has not been a request made to DOT to uh, begin design on any of these. And so I, in, in, in perhaps Mr. Morton would like to weigh in, in in terms of what it actually takes to deliver this, but it's not as simple as just saying um, throw up some signs of using paint. It does require the full environmental and design process under a federal aid project. I understand, but, but this was submitted two years ago to DOT. I worked with Scott Thomas on this, and we worked it all out two years ago. So I. I you know, it was submitted. Um, so, a, a, so what it sounds like is that you think it was submit. You, you had thought that somebody was actually working on this. I had thought that it was in the queue to be included. DOT does not start a project unless it's specifically requested to do by the municipality, and that, that's a, kind of an organizational thing at this point. But at this at this point, we have two projects that are underway that can use about three hundred thousand dollars this year, and then and unless this project gets some design funds that could be the projects that are underway right now are already fully funded. That's what the hundred thousand. That's why we keep adding money to them. You see, we have oh, they're, they're broken out separate. They're yeah, right. those th those are fully funded. They don't need to be part of this money. This would be this a good use of this money would perhaps be begin a lot of design starts. I mean, if you want a shelf full of projects, you have to have funding to start a design. That funding needs to be identified in the tip. This is a good place to put it. Thank you. So that's, that's what I was trying yeah. to. And, and I guess another question is, is, is the million dollars enough to, uh, you know, what I'm hearing from the public is they want more than, since this has been an area that's been underinvested for a number of years, a you growing can, area. You can see that we're spending $100,000 just to add bicycle lanes on Arctic Boulevard through the federal process. And it takes two years to do that so far. So. Based on that, you can make an adjustment on how much money you need. But. I think the project manager was requesting more funding. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's more than 200. I, I had a quick question myself. Just in looking at some of these projects and some of the things that are recommended, I know that within the MPP, the plan for C Street can be restriped to have actually additional lanes on C Street using the existing pavement. <coughs> and then there's a project on here that says to restrike entire roadway to add bike lanes. Those projects between MTP and this would then be in conflict with each other. So I don't know if some of these have been completely flushed out. It's just a question. I mean, they would have to, those sorts of details would need to be looked at. I'm sorry, Mr. Morris, I cut you off. No, no. <laughs> uh, I just had a question um, about what proportion of a bicycle project like one of these that's listed in this goes to design and environmental. I mean, what is it? Is it twenty percent of the total project cost, or is it? I, mean, I guess I'm asking. I mean, is it, or is that too broad of a question? I'd say it's too broad of a question. Every project's different. Okay. Purchase right away, relocate utilities. Well, let me, let me, maybe it's the same thing a different way. <clears throat> when you look at these estimated costs, is that inclusive or exclusive of the environmental and the permitting and everything that has to? Be? So this number could be too low. I don't know the answer. 
through the chair, Mr. Grupo. Uh, these are construction only. Okay. And for instance, if you look at Arctic Boulevard, which is number 10, uh, this was the project, and these were the costs from uh, the bike plan. Uh, 85640 and with the environmental and everything, we know it's going to be close to around 200000 So, if that answers well. Are there any other questions or comments from the committee at this time? All right, hearing none, this item will actually now be open for public comment. And in the interest of time, just like I know there are a lot of people here to testify and we don't want to limit anybody really from being able to speak, but it is 3.30 and we cannot be here all night, so just like at the assembly, we would ask that we please limit each presentation to three minutes, just like we do at the assembly. And I thought Craig just ran out on me, but I'm wondering if he could go and grab his phone so we have the time on <laughs> <laughs> Which is part of it, so. Hold on for this Of course. Yeah, this is Chris Riesenberg with Federal Highway Administration. I was just, um, from the federal perspective, we don't get into what project we select. We push that to the locals to do. One of the things that I just wanted to remind, um, under Map 21, the um, transportation enhancement transportation alternatives program um, under those requirements now with map 21 it requires a competitive process um, in order to select those projects um, and also to go along with that um, we now have some national goals um, that were set by Congress for um, basically national program any federal funds they, they want those projects to help achieve those national goals. Um, first and foremost, their safety. Second, there's infrastructure condition. Third, it's con congestion reduction. Fourth, it's system reliability. Um, fifth, it's freight movement and economic vitality. Um, those were the key national goals we're hoping to achieve. And I think in the future, as you talk about projects you select, you want to be talking about getting those outcomes that help accomplish those national goals by your project. And it's something to keep in mind as we're working toward implementing MAP 21. There's going to be a transition period here, of course, and there will be the national performance measures that come out and then shortly after that there will be a requirement for the low for AMAS to establish some performance targets to try to achieve those measures. It's something to keep in mind that if you're making an argument for projects, that argument should be trying to get outcomes that relate to some of those national goals because again this is where the federal funds come. They, Congress expects those type of outcomes for their dollars. We're not going to tell you which projects to select, but it's one something that you got to keep in mind as, as you move forward. Chris, would you mind repeating those five top national goals again? Number one, yeah. is safety. First and foremost is safety. And next is infrastructure condition. Um, infrastructure condition or as we kind of the nebulous term they use is state of good repair um, number three is congestion reduction um, four is system reliability uh, number five is freight movement and economic vitality there's actually two more national goals but they don't necessarily weigh in they're more project delivery type thing um, or environmental sustainability, and then the seventh one is reduced project delivery delays. <coughs> but the first five are the key ones when you're looking at which projects to pick. Um, Chris, this is Lois Epstein. Um, the environmental sustainability goal you mentioned, which is relevant to our discussion, how is 
how is that meant to be, how does that fit in? Because you mentioned five, but then you said there are these additional two. Well, um, a lot of it, uh, that I think mainly goes along with uh, project development, but also it could fit in by um, reducing air quality emissions um, would be something that go with it. There, some of these national goals, like I said, will be coming out with performance measures nationally. Um, and then they'll roll out to, uh, hopefully those national performance measures will help you define where you put targets and how you put that. But I would, I would make my guess the environmental sustainability is redu reduction of emissions um, and things along those lines. So there's really more than five goals. There are seven goals. Is that what I'm hearing? That's what I'm confused Correct. about. Okay. Uh, yeah. The environmental sustainability, besides reducing emissions, it's a little harder to quantify. And I, I would expect our national goal to be something along the lines of emissions reduction, because it's something you can measure and you can make a target for achieving that with environmental sustainability. Um, some of the other type of environmental improvements are a little harder to measure, and so not very good for a performance measure, I guess. Thank you, Chris. Yep. So, Craig, right, um, so so <laughs> <laughs> right as you left the room, I was going to turn it over to the public and um, so we're not here all night. Um, also, I know that there were, I mean, we, we did receive um, 125 written comments, and although I have not had the chance to read through all of them, I have started thumbing through them. I appreciate your summary of the comments, reading through and listening to the summary of comments. That was very helpful, at least, but then I started flipping through the comments myself. Um, if you sent in a written comment and you think it summarizes everything that you wanted to share, I don't want you to feel as though it's necessary to make another formal statement in, in, in the room unless you feel there is something in addition that you want to add above and beyond. If there's something I know I've written things out for, hit send and go, I forgot to add that. If there's something else you want to add, please feel free to stand up and share with us. And once again, Please remember that when you stand up to state your name, and if you have a little bit strange name like mine, please spell it for the record. So, this is your time to speak. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Lippins, and I'm the president of Bicycle Commuters of Anchorage, and that's L-I-T-M-A-N-S. Um, as you know, Bicycle Commuters of Anchorage uh, recommended that bicyclists submit comments to the AMAX TAC um, recommending that there be greater allocation of funding for transportation enhancements, particularly with respect to implementation of the bike plan. Um, the main reason why BCA with its 1,000 plus supporters and over 125 people who are submitting individually written comments to TAC, which I believe is um, likely unprecedented and showing up at a meeting like this today is because they feel it's vitally important to provide greater funding for bicycle facilities in Anchorage. Um, I also just want to note you know, we fully support, BCA fully supports pedestrian funding as well, but we are focused on our mission is to make Anchorage bicycle friendly. A city that's bicycle friendly has two key components. One, it's safe to bike and two, it's convenient. You cannot conveniently get around Anchorage without a bike network. That's what the bike plan is all about. Two, without a bike network, it's not safe to bike. We have about 1.5% of Anchorage that is the bike modal share. Um, typically, cities max out without bicycle infrastructure, bicycle facilities. They max out at about 1% modal share. So we are maxed out. We will not see bicycle modal share increase substantially without actually implementing a bike plan. And that's why BCA is strongly encouraging further allocation of funding to implement the bike plan. We think it's vitally important to provide a safe place for people to bike. Um, and right now, Anchorage is uh, inadequately providing that space for bicyclists. 
Um, I think you'll probably hear and you'll see in the written testimony a lot of people are talking about safety because it's a major concern. It's one of the things BCA hears most often from the bicyclists out on the streets. And we also hear from people who don't bike. And they won't bike until there's more bicycle facilities. Cities across the country have seen that when you build a bicycle network, they do come. And bike modal share does rise. But we won't see it until we actually do it. The plan was passed in 2010. It's been two years. There is one million allocated in 2013. BCA certainly encourages that that stay and is asking for an additional 2.2 million, which would be 3.2. And if you look at the flight plan, and these numbers are based on 2010, so they won't fully, we understand that they won't fully support the implementation. When you look at the bike plan, 3.1 went to implementation of the core slash collision routes. These were identified in the bike plan as top eight priority projects. <coughs> top eight priority projects address one core networks, two collision routes, safety, and three, they address um, something that can be implemented easily, i.e. just striping and signing. I, I will try to be as quick as I can, but I think it's very important that to uh, address a few things that I heard today that are a little bit of concern to BCA. One is the comparison of apples and oranges with respect to funding when looking at transportation enhancements and the percentage with the goal of 10 to 15 percent. And there's discussion of projects like Downley or West Downley where there uh, are bike and ped facilities incorporated. These are two different brackets and the goal is 10 to 15 percent under transportation enhancements. We're encouraging that that percentage go up to implement the bike plan. The second uh, that's a major concern is the discussion regarding design issues. The one million that's being allocated in 2013, I also sit on the Bike Pedestrian Advisory Committee. We had our first meeting earlier this week, and Mr. Lyon informed us of the projects that would be implemented. These are projects on the sheet that Ms. Stank can provide um, and that have already been identified. These are all within the top A priority for collision route projects. These are important routes that will improve safety. Um, and that one million doesn't go to studies. It goes to seven projects, eight projects, rather. One is Bike Boulevard, seven are bike lanes. Five of those projects are in Chugiak, Eagle River. Three are in Anchorage. One is a bicycle lane on Wisconsin. One is a bicycle lane on Raspberry. And the other is a bicycle boulevard downtown. These are actual projects ready to go in 2013. And so are the other projects here. We're talking about striping and signing. This is not some redesign of a bridge type concept. The idea that BCA is proposing is implementation of, of, of bike lanes, striping and signing easy projects that could make a big difference. Um, and I would I just highlight that the MAP 21 goals are easily hit with these. We're talking safety. We're talking reduction in traffic congestion, certainly environmental sustainability, and economic uh, vitality. There's multiple studies that are coming out across the country where cities are implementing bike networks that it's good for business and it would be good for business here. Step so step with step that, I hope you up. listen to all the comments that the other bicyclists and would be likely to have provided. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, Committee Todd Logan, um, and you've seen me here before, I think. Um, <coughs> I want to spend just a moment, uh, certainly I'm not going to speak for the people that are here today, even though I think it's no small thing that they took time either day to get here. Um, but I will talk a little bit about the summary of public comments, just because I know many of you have a chance to leap through them. But I did find it a huge challenge uh, paging through almost 127 uh, pages of public comments that came in on this. What I found most fascinating by it was, one, this wasn't a click a button to submit a comment. Uh, that's not the way it went out, and I think if you look at these, while there were some common themes and maybe even a little cut and paste, um, I certainly won't disagree with that. 125 people took their time to actually write you something. In many cases, it was a lot more than just give us more money. It was thoughtful. There were reasons behind it. And so I think what you're seeing is just a real concern about a lot of people about the slow progress in bike and pedestrian infrastructure uh, in the city. Um, as, as Brian stated, uh, you know, a large number of people asked for something rather specific, and it was uh, taken kind of from what a BCA recommendation of the 
uh, let's invest money in Stripe consigning the core bike network, something that to me can't be that difficult. I know everything is difficult. I know there's environmental documents, but Stripe and signage is not the same as acquiring right away, moving utilities, and things like that. And these, in most cases, are talking about the asphalt's there. It's painting the lines. I know you can't turn a guy loose with a paint truck. It's much more complicated than that. But, you know, we're getting ready to spend $42 million on dowling. That must be complicated, and we're figuring it out, and we're doing it. And uh, so I think that's very important. If you look at why people thought this was important, it's probably no big surprise that over half the people, the first and foremost was safety. We've had several significant both bicycle and pedestrian accidents here in this town. I know that's not lost on you this summer. Whether or not painted bike lanes would have made a difference on those particular accidents, I certainly can't say. But there's no doubt that dedicated bike lanes add to safety. And if, and if I may, an article that was shared uh, with me uh, just today, and I will not speak about it further, uh, is it just a recent study, a uh, scientific study on dedicated bike lanes that cut cycling injuries in half. And it's a reference to a scientific study, and I have copies for all the members if you would. I was going to actually download the source, uh, the source study, but they wanted 40 bucks for me to do it this morning. I'm dedicated, but I wasn't quite that dedicated. <laughs> but anyway, but I think that, that is a nice summary, and I think it's important. And I know it's not lost on you that bike lanes are helpful, but I think this is one of the first documented studies that the significant reduction in injury came to bike lanes. And that's what most of the people in this room are asking for. As far as other things that people said was important, what surprised me a little bit was number two on the list why this was important was to, re to improve residents' health, reduce obesity, and provide more exercise opportunities. This is a, you know, if you read the paper or, or look around and look at your friends, uh, this nation is facing obesity epidemic and other problems with lack of exercise. Biking is one of the great ways to do it. Certainly the environmental benefits, uh, no big surprise, uh, but that wasn't the impetus of what most people talked about. Attracting new residents was huge. The idea that who wants who to move to Anchorage and why? Uh, the type of people, one of the things, many people that are, have discretion of where they move and live, do we have good bike and pedestrian facilities? Uh, one that came down near the bottom, I'll mention very briefly, uh, that wasn't mentioned much in the bike plan or in the comments, was that bike infrastructure is good for business. And I do believe this will resonate with the mayor and others in this town. Um, if I may, I'll share just one other article, once again short. This was just published in the Energy Bulletin. Uh, called Biking for Better Business. And mostly it talks about mayors and cities like Minneapolis, as well as CEOs of major companies and what they look at to make a vibrant city and what they're finding more and more, especially to attract young and well-educated workers, is they will locate their businesses in places that have good bike and pedestrian infrastructure. Anchorage is not that far from it. That's something that we can do. But in all honesty, I think it's happening slowly, and I think it's happening too slowly. And I think that's why you see the people uh, here today I think you're seeing some frustration. One or two other things I'll quickly mention uh, based on things that were said. Um, you know, there was a lot, of this, a lot of talk about, well, we're, you know, we're doing 4% allocation proposed uh, for transportation enhancements this year, 6% next. And, and that, when added over a four-year average, squeaks us above the minimum of 10%. Well, when something's important, the minimum's not good enough. And I think that's why you see the frustration that, you know, we're only talking about 4% in 13, 6% in 14. I don't think it's unreasonable to be pushing those numbers up over the 10% level and probably closer to the 15% level. Uh, there is a lot of talk, rightly so, about, well, you're getting great projects tied to road projects. I don't disagree. I don't want to be ungrateful. I'm not, and I doubt anybody in this room is ungrateful about getting great new infrastructure as part of Dowling Road and some of these other ones. But in all honesty, that's the standard way of doing business now. That is, when we rework stuff, complete streets is the deal. And so while it's important, and I'm not being dismissive of it, that is what we should expect. That is standard operating procedure. But what we have is this huge gap of bike plan stuff that's not tied to roads, and that's what we want to see funded. The low-hanging fruit is striping and signing of, of, of road networks. And then I guess last, I'll just say, if I am a little frustrated, I know things are complicated. But I just find it hard to believe with all the challenging projects that are done in this town that we are kind of what I'm hearing is this is too complicated and not far enough along in planning. There's no way we can spend more than a million bucks on bike plan implementation in the next two years. I just I can't believe it's true. I think if you truly felt this was important and want to do it, I think this group and the engineers between the state and the muni can figure this out, get the work plans done, and we can get this done. So I'll just uh, summarize that I think why many people are here today 
is they want this committee to adjust this proposed allocation. This is not what this, these folks in this room want to see presented to planning and zoning. It's not what we want to see presented to uh, the assembly, and it's not what we want to see presented to the policy committee. We'd like to see an adjustment made to this to improve funding, hopefully to some, at least 3.2 million uh, for bike plan implementation, and figure out how to make that happen and have that move forward from this meeting. So, thank you very much. My name is Rosemary Austin, and I've been a bike commuter. I also drive, I also walk um, in this town. And I participated in the early stages of developing the bike plan. And some of the big things that we talked about when we first started on this plan were getting people into and through the business districts in town. And we also talked a lot about getting people safely across the Seward Highway. So we talked a lot about the east-west route. Um, getting the highway raised is a huge benefit to the people who want to cross town east-west. If you've ever tried to cross the Seward Highway by going over the overpass versus um, hiking your bike under and kind of dragging it through the creek, um, you'll know how much people are going to appreciate um, this connector. Um, getting people into and out of and through business districts is, is critical. And what I'd suggest is I'd recommend anybody who is working on road projects in this town to grab your bike and ride downtown. Ride from Midtown to downtown, South, South Anchorage to Midtown, so that you can get an understanding of what it takes to navigate through this city on a bicycle or even on foot. Um, using a map is great, but having the, having an organized system of signage on the roads makes commuting so much easier and encourages people to commute between those parts of town. Um, I have worked in Anchorage in, um, in a bike shop for over a dozen years and what I noticed, um, especially when gas prices went up, was more people wanted to be able to commute to work. So they would come to us and they would say, but how do I get there? What's the best route? And even if you pull out a map, you don't always know how to, and, and I have to um, give props to the Muni for doing a, a map that's free, so that people can pick up a map with bike routes on it. But the, the big thing is, if I'm just riding around on town and I don't have my map, seeing a striped lane, seeing a sign that points to downtown, seeing a sign even on one of the multi-use paths that tells me what street I'm headed toward when I'm going into Midtown or into downtown is very helpful for the commuter. We, we see this a lot on our, um, on our recreational trails too. If, people, if we don't have good signage on our recreational trails, people are less likely to go out there on their own. They want to go with a friend. If you're riding to work, they don't have your friend with you, they live across, they work across town. So having consistent signage, accurate signage, um, striping gives us um, the way to find our, our, our routes through town. The other thing it does, what striping does, and nobody's mentioned this one yet, it's not only to show the riders, the cyclists, where it's safe to ride, it tells the people in the car, expect more cyclists in this area. You're going to see more cyclists in this area. So when we, when we make signs, it not only helps the, um, the cyclists find their way, it helps drivers know that this is where I should see more, more cyclists. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yvonne Goldsmith. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I was the AMAC senior transportation planner from 1975 to 1981, and Mr. Parker here was on the advisory committee. Um, I saw when I worked for the meeting as a planner that the community started asking for uh, safer pedestrian uh, walkways and alternatives to uh, motor vehicle transportation uh, since 75. And in the 37 years since then, we've made fantastic progress. We have had an 180 uh, turnaround in attitude towards pedestrians and bicycles. And yet, I still see that the amount of resources that we put into roadway construction and improvement for safety is tremendous. But uh, what we've done for uh, pedestrians and bikes has been very, very small, a lot, but very, very small in comparison to what we've done for roadways. And so maybe there's some catch up to be done. Uh, I've seen in the last 10 years that 
when we did start uh, building more complete streets, that the uh, bike paths and uh, the multi transportation, I mean, the, uh, the, 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 the paths alongside the arterial roads have increased with uh, the pedestrian traffic and bikes traffic by quite a bit. Because when I have my, when I'm sitting at the light and I see through the computer, I almost always see other bikers and pedestrians there. And it wasn't, it wasn't like that before. So um, I do support everything that Brian did. So thank you. Thank you, Hi, I'm uh, Ryan Lawson, L-A-W-T-O-N. Um, I did submit comments online, uh, but a few things have come up here. I very much appreciate your time. I appreciate how much discussion is even happening about this. Um, I've learned quite a few things about the process, and I have no claim to know how the budgeting and, and the money bit works, but um, it sounds like even at this table um, there's been some revelations here, so I'm great. Um, thank you for making this discussion happening. Really pleased to hear some advocacy within within the group as well. Um, as one of the most important comments I, I think I just heard that I want to re re reiterate is that um, even, even something as simple as you know, striping, um, I'm happy to ride in the shoulder if it exists. Um, pedestrian pathways and cyclist pathways are, are not at all the same. Um, as, any, as any commuter will, will tell you, pedestrian, uh, uh, pedestrian punishings, as I call them, at intersections um, uh, are, are not a great way to get around when you're just trying to do so. Um, I've come to highly appreciate and favor roads that Again, um, whether or not it's marked as a bike lane, um, usually it's it's the shoulder of the road. Sometimes it's got a little bike sign. Sometimes it doesn't. Great. Um, uh, one of the one of the nice things about that when there is some sort of signage is it lets the motorists know that a bike's okay to be there. Um, you know, they're allowed to share the asphalt with you. Um, the number of times that I've been honked at, yelled at to get off the road, get on the sidewalk, even when I'm not even in the lane of traffic, um, can be disconcerting. Um, so I think it's great to remind motorists that bikes belong there. Um, uh, at, at the same time, uh, you know, you can see uh, how often at crossings and intersections, you know, pretty much any place where a uh, pedestrian crossing would be, it's <coughs> plow clear through it before they, they don't stop until they enter the line of traffic. And, and I think it's one of those things you don't get until you become a bike commuter. I didn't realize I was a bad driver. I used to be um uh, until now so it's it's one of these uh, revelations um that uh, you can't really force upon people, um, but i think anything that we can do to increase the sort of omnipresent reminder um that bikes are allowed to use the road because uh, many motorists are not just ignorant but willfully ignorant uh, about it um, so thank you so much for your time Hey, uh, my name's Heidi Zimmer. It's Z-I-M-M-E-R. Um, my husband and I have biked around this town for a number of years. Uh, we have one car between us, and that's how we're able to do that. Um, and that car usually sits all week also. Um, so it's a pretty good lifestyle. Um, this is about safety. Um, my husband has also managed to survive. I think he's up to five collisions with cars now. Um, two of those were on the sidewalk, one was in a crosswalk. Um, Anchorage drivers are lousy. Anyway, um, so I am really glad to see you guys bringing this up and really seriously considering this. And also I'd like to add to the comment about thank you for um, providing some of, at least some of your deliberations to the public. I've just learned quite a bit. Um, and I'm glad to hear about bike and pedestrian access being included in other projects like with the Dowling and the O'Malley um, and whatnot, some of these other road projects. But again, that should be a basic part of transportation planning. It's not extra credit. Um, and also, as a matter, just as a matter of scale, we're talking about at most the $3.2 million, which I, by the way, like to say for the record, I think you should be implementing the bike plan, $3.2 million. And that would affect roads all over town that pretty much everybody, um, it, I would say that probably most people that bike around town or would bike around town use as opposed to single projects, you know, the 40 million or whatever it is for Dowling that affects just one small part of town. 
So it's a small amount of money as far as compared to the amount of people that it would affect. Um, also, just like about bike lanes, um, sharing the road is a, it's a good slogan. Um, it doesn't work without some clear communication about how to share the road and which part the bikes go in and which part the cars go in. And like a couple of other people have said, that is um, just communication, basic organization between drivers and cyclists. Um, I guess the only, the only other thing I want to say is, um, you know, Anchorage has some really great recreational trails. I love them. I bike them, I run them, I ski them. Um, but once you get off the trail system and try to go somewhere, go to work, run errands, go anywhere in a business district, it gets almost impossible if you're not in a car. And I've talked to coworkers during the summer, you know, bike to work day sorts of things um, at a couple of different workplaces. And what I hear from most of them is that, yeah, gosh, it's great you ride a bike to work. Sorry, I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> it's great you ride a bike to work. Gosh, I wish I could. I'm just scared to get out on the road. And, um, you know, again, that's anecdotal. I realize the plural of anecdote is not data, but I'm sure BCA can uh, supply you with the stacks of studies that people have actually done where they crunch the numbers to support all of this. So again, thank you for taking the time to consider this. Thank you, Hi, my name is Gordon Descutner. That's D-E-S-C-U-T-N-E-R. <clears throat> I've been in Alaska about 16 years, 15 of which has been in the Girdwood or Anchorage Bowl area, specifically the last four years in the Anchorage Bowl. And I like to bike. Um, I like my kids to bike. I like to commute to work. I try to do that summer and winter whenever possible. But I have found that, especially when I'm riding with my kids who like to get out and about, it's pretty dangerous to do that with them. It's very difficult to get around with my children. It's dangerous for myself to get around, but, but I'm able to, to navigate um, because I, I have a greater awareness than my young kids do. Um, so I do think this is important. I appreciate you taking the time to talk about this. Um, and I did submit uh, a comment. It's one of the 125 you received. I am in support of the, the additional funding. Um, I do think it's disconcerting that there's not a project or a plan. If that's what I heard correctly earlier, I think that should be a goal of this this group is to, to make sure that there are projects to utilize that money and, and then and then allocate an appropriate amount of money to to uh, those projects. Um, I, I would ride more with my family. I'd encourage my family to ride more if, if we were able to do that more easily. What I found is a lot of, there are some pretty good dedicated bike corridors, but they tend to start and end abruptly and so it's difficult to get onto and off those corridors with my family. Um, I think that the signage and striping, as many others have mentioned, is important. I think it increases the driver awareness, even in areas where those don't exist. It does keep, a, keep people thinking about that. I think it's important those, uh, those, those comments that Brian mentioned right off the bat that, you know, a plan should, should make biking safe. It should be safer to bike, and it should be more convenient to bike. And I don't think we have really either one of those in, in Anchorage yet, but I, I do see progress happening. Um, I grew up in a, in a community years ago. I lived outside in, in an excellent biking community. I have family there. I still I have a portable bike. I take it back there. I ride whenever I can there because I know I can do it safely and I can get everywhere I need to go without any difficulty because they have great biking infrastructure. It would be great if we had that here in Anchorage. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Gordon. Sam, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what was your name again? Sam Dubois, D-U-B-O-I-S. I really think we have some wonderful infrastructure already, I do. But this is an article from the paper, uh, Elizabeth Blumink. She says, um, we need $63 million improvements. It's possible to increase bike safety. That was for bike auto collisions. Illustrate a need for $63 million of improvements. And is it possible to increase the bikes in Anchorage and make it safer at the same time? The city thinks so for several years, and this was written in April the 25th, 2009. And, and that's our frustration, I think. It's since 97, there's been, you know, over and over again, plans made, and we hope this works, and we'd like to see this happening. And it's further in the article, it says with 1,800 uh, bike vehicle crashes between 94 and 206, and eight of those were fatal. And, and we're seeing the same thing happening today. With, 
you know, of course, it wouldn't eliminate accidents if we improve it, but it seems like we need to make a decision to move this forward. There's an accident that if we do have like this, people will use it, and we already know the benefits of it. Here at the end of the article, it says, for the next four years, we'll have 51 miles of uh, At the end of it, it says 18.7 million for the next four years, and 63.8 million over the next 20 years. We'd like to see some of that allocated, I think. That's what I'm standing up for myself and any of my friends that you'd like to know. We really appreciate what you're doing and the time that you're taking and allowing us to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, I'm Janice Tower. Um, I'm here to represent the Arctic Bicycle Club, which of which there's about 400 plus members. Um, I'm on the board of, of the Arctic Bicycle Club. and. Um, also, I'm director and a board member of the uh, Mighty Bikes organization. We have 250 kids in our biking program, and um, I'm also on the board of Single Track Advocates, which represents about 300 plus mountain bikers in this city, uh, many of whom also ride on the road. So that's about 900 to 1,000 individual cyclists, perhaps. Um, my primary interest is in safety. My passion is in children, and this is why um, we started the Mighty Bikes program about 13 years ago. Riding on trails is great. It gets kids an opportunity to learn skills, by handling skills, but sooner or later, you know, we like to try to segue them out on to the road so that they can um, learn to ride road bikes safely. Um, I also work with um, a small uh, junior bike racing team and these kids are in their in their teenage years <coughs> pretty much um, drivers learner learners permit age all the way um, up to 18 um, when I take these kids out on the road I'm really kind of afraid for them because there are very few places that I can I feel like I can safely take um, kids even teenagers uh, to train and learn the rules of the road. Uh, it's, I think, a really healthy activity for these kids to move from mountain biking into road cycling and perhaps become um, bike commuters. But in this town, it's just really, really difficult for that. There's so few places for them and, and for me to take them right now. And I think through this uh, improved funding for striping and signage, I think we take a big, giant leap in that direction. So really encourage you to spend some investment money up front, $3.2 million, and make a commitment. Stick your necks out. You know, try to get this done and to demonstrate to the community of Anchorage that we are progressive. We do, do encourage healthy outdoor lifestyles. Um, I think it's a, a real statement to a community at large uh, when you can be out on the road and see cyclists having fun, uh, riding to work and and send a clear message to motorists that this is a bicycle friendly city and I as a responsible motorist need to stay in my lane and and allow cyclists to use their lanes too. I think everybody can get along but it's, it starts with the funding and that's um, what we hope that you will support. So, throw my two cents in. My name is uh, my name is Tim Tim Snap. Uh, last name is S N A P P. Um, I've been living on my bike for the last year and a half. I came up to Anchorage and on a vacation on on a bike tour, ended up getting a job at REI in the bicycle department. And my <laughs> two trucks and two motorcycles are in a storage unit outside. But um, I um, I've been commuting around. Alaska, my bike, all since basically, believe it or not, since '73, um, and um, I just think what, what, I can't imagine this city without the coastal trail. Uh, when I first got up here, there was a big trail. It was very popular. People went there every evening. It's called the railroad tracks, and um, I think part of the, one of the biggest parts about the signage and stripe signing and stripe. Signing and striped giraffe. Anyway, I would say that um, is that it's it is um, mm -hmm. saying to the to motorists to the community that bicyclists um, bicycle commuting 
bicycling is a um, is an important part of this community, and um, I mean Anchorage is. I mean, I just rode here today on the up the Chester Creek Trail, and um, it's just stunning. Anchorage is is. I mean, I've been I've traveled all around the world, and it, it keeps getting driven home with me that Anchorage is one of the most beautiful geographic places on the planet. It really is. It's it's stunning, and. Um, like I said, for the last year and a half, I've been I, I've been forced to ride my bike everywhere, even though I got a four-wheel drive Toyota truck outside, and it's actually wonderful. Like to, to come here today, I was instead of being on the hop of my truck and come here at the last minute, I had to ride up the Chester Creek Trail, and um, it's like uh, it's unbelievable how beautiful that trail is right now, and um, so uh, I think one of the reasons I've stuck with commuting is um, bicycling. Well, I'm a passionate cyclist, but uh, in PE when I was a kid. Basically, it started with baseball. Um, somehow, I, I learned how physical activity is such a, um, I, was a, I was a good student, but uh, I also learned that physical activity is so essential to your, uh, not only your physical health, but to your mental health. And um, it's really weird because I found that, uh, that um, physical activity is really better for my mind than it is for my body, and it's incredibly good for my body. You know, and so, uh, riding your bike during the winter, uh, it's great for seasonal affective disorder, um, but it's also great for our air. And uh, anyway, that's uh, what I want to say. I think we need this. Uh, I don't know. We we need to Anchorage should have a uh, people should get the feeling that uh, cycling is is a part of of this city, and uh, walking too, and. Um, and that sign-in striving is, is part of saying that, yes, this is an important part of our city and every, everything we do, I mean, we have incredible trails in this town, incredible. But um, when you try to get to any particular point, that's where you get into trouble. And, um, and uh, I mean, I, I want to be positive, but I got to say, um, I grew up on motorcycles and um, I hate to say it, but this town is incredibly dangerous. For cycling commuters, and I'm I'm a I, I work at the REI in, in the cycling department, and um, I I have a stroke on my helmet on my bars, and um, it's very dangerous. But I'm aggressively safe uh, when I ride. Uh, but I took a safety course with the League of American Cyclists uh, this summer, and uh, after three days with the with the Anchorage Police Department, all cops, and I got in this class with all cops, right? And I'm riding back in that class after three days of doing studying safety, I'm riding down the uh, C Street from down at um, south end of town. I was riding the whole entire length of the C Street path, and they were doing construction on the on the um, east side of the road. So I had to go to the west side. So I'm I'm going against traffic. I'm on the bike lane on the against traffic, and I almost got hit. I mean, I almost got plowed into by a car. The biggest, most dangerous thing can happen in this town is people turning right. Without looking, without looking. I mean, they're looking left. I mean, they're turning right. And they're looking left, and a car, brand new four-wheel drive truck, almost plowed into me. And I was, I had, I was looking at the little walking guy for, you know, for 100 feet, and I just started riding into the, uh, you know, the bike path feeds right onto the, onto the, um, onto the crosswalk, and it was a classic case. And I've been studying it for the last three days, and the guy almost plowed into me, and I had my strobe on my helmet, and I almost got, I mean, hit bad coming back from a safety class. And I was thinking about safety on the whole time. So um, anyway, thank you very much and uh, for your time. Thank you, Tim. Now, I don't, if there's anybody else who would like to testify at this time, it is now 4.15 p.m. and we still have to deliberate ourselves. And so we either need to decide whether we're going to continue this meeting until 5 or whether we're going to continue this meeting at a later date. So is there anyone else that feels any I just one minute, real quick. He won't last very long anyway. But <laughs> I just want to appreciate, or so please state your name for um, My name is Mary Reeves, R E E B E S. And um, I really appreciate that I've been able to bike commute, not just me, but our trail system was safe enough that when my other son was this age, I was able to bike from the hillside to downtown bike commuting with my son. And there aren't too many cities where that can happen. And, now I have him in daycare on O'Malley, and if there were a bike path on O'Malley, I would be able to bike commute with him there. So I just wanted to um, 
say how much I appreciate funding that goes toward this thing. My family spent $350 on gasoline last month, which is appalling to me, and I just, I want us to be able to move forward by supporting things like the bike safety and safe bike paths. Charlie is planning for a Maui, by the way, so. <laughs> it's in the works. <laughs> One quick piece, Marsha Howell, the WEOL, the director of the Alaska Injury Prevention Center, and on the BCA board. So one thing that hasn't been mentioned is, um, and it's one of those one more issues, congestion reduction. I'm happy to take a lane if I need to on a road where there isn't a bike lane, but I'll tell you what, the cars behind me aren't so happy with me. If I have my own lane and they had their own lane, we would reduce con uh, congestion right there. So I'd be love to have my own space and I'd be happy to share the road. It's not always the best thing for me to just take the road, but I will. That's all. Thank you, Mark. We have several more. We're going to have to decide. I'm sorry, we're going to have to bring it back to the committee and decide on whether they're going to continue because we're not even going to have time to deliberate this time. So, I know, I was like, can we have a show of hands of how many more people want to testify at this time? Okay. So, the question for the committee is do we want to continue this meeting until 5 o'clock? And that is the latest I can stay because I have an appointment at 6.15. And I got one at 5, so I'm going to have to leave. Yes. Um, or continue the meeting. So it would be next, I think. I think that's valuable. How many people have to leave at 4 30? I know. How many people have to, I mean, I guess how many people have to leave by 5? Or by you have to leave by 4 30? By 4 30. 4.30, so 3 of us will be gone. Does anybody else need to go? Madam Chair, I move that we extend until 5 o'clock, um, and then we can get done sooner. But second. 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 Just discussion. I, are we under a time frame for this? No time crunch uh, in if we don't go too long. I mean, we've got P and Z on the seventh. We've got assembly after that. Uh, and the sooner we can get this thing obligated, the better in terms of getting obligated for next year. But I don't. I don't know if you have any more information on. No, it's just the further it goes, the least amount of time we have to obligate this fiscal year. That's the only thing. Certainly do. State fiscal year. State fiscal year. No, federal fiscal year. Federal fiscal year? Okay. So, so September. September. Uh, and, I, and I think one of the things that's a, you know, I believe it, what do you think to keep in mind is, is um, what it comes down to is can the municipality uh, obligate a million dollars worth of this fiscal year to get things shelf ready for future members and adding more money to it? And so I, I looked at the, the muni on that. But and, I, and, and I've got to leave here very shortly, and so I was going to ask that question mm -hmm. of the state, and and I got it from Ken. They couldn't. I I, I don't follow if it were if it were bond funds, if it were legislative grant, and we were to talk about going out and striping. Yes, I could do it. No problem. Get it done this summer. But since it's federal funding, and the process you have to do, and I don't know. I mean, I mean, thinking we might have to get a consultant on board and tell you how long that takes to go one under contract, six months, to even just have to issue them a notice of receipt. So if we're doing it, I don't think so. And my question is, is if we, if, if we don't think we can spend a million bucks, why up 2013 to 3.2 million dollars? Why aren't we looking at 2000? or 15 or a combination so we can have the time to if you want us to put it together um, do it 
go through the process because you know we can make the right. I mean, the the and say, yeah, let's do something and bring it up to three point two million dollars. That's a false expectation, and everybody thinks that striping. Yes, if like I said, it was bond funds or, or grant funds. I don't see any problem with that. That's it's almost no brainer, but going through the process would have to do, um, or the state. Um, and you mentioned it'd have to get on the stip. Is that well? It needs to show up in the tip before we can even request the sign fund. So that's more my point. So Sorry. I mean, that's a. We could do that. Well, the item for us really is whether or not we think we can finish this discussion, this decision today, or whether we need to continue until what? next week. The motion has been made to continue to apply today. Are there any opposed to continuing to apply today? Or should not only oppose, I just won't be here for the discussion. I'm not opposed and I won't be here either. Yeah, it, that, yeah. I'm not opposed to that, so we will continue until at least five. We're now at 423. I guess just before us is hearing the last three testimonies and then our deliberations will be able to finish with five today, or should we just decide to continue until next week? Well, I think we should at least Try to get the three that are here that want to do it. I agree. I don't think we'll finish the But even if we start, it's helpful to the audience. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. All right. So at this time, we'll go to the next three. Actually, the, I said the three hands that came up. The first one was actually in the back. Hi, my name is Pedro. And uh, Pedro Kim. And um, I uh, I mountain bike a lot and and uh, so there's recreationally I bike a lot but uh, I do commute a little bit um, bicycle commute and um, but because there aren't bike lanes or, or I have to share the road uh, the, the bike path and uh, with with pedestrians um, and um, most of my things are, are in Midtown and. Um, East Anchors and all these and South Southwest Anchors. Uh, I don't regularly bicycle commute as, as you see a lot of people do. And um, but if there were bike lanes, uh, not only it would it would make um, it would cut down on time. It would it would be more time efficient for bicycle commuters to get around town. And um, and uh, and I would I would become a, a more of a, a regular bicycle commuter. As well as a, a recreational bike commuters, and, uh, and please make the bike lanes in Anchorage uh, happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Well, Parker, uh, my uh, children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren have been biking in this town for 55 years since we moved here from the bush. And uh, I worry a lot about the great grandchildren. It's incredibly more dangerous now than it ever has been in any period of that 55 years. And uh, you need a larger police force to throw more of these guys in jail. But uh, we've got to do everything we can for my great grandchildren. So thank you. Sir. My name is Robert Shipley. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, for the public to come there on this meeting. Uh, I'm a, a long time bicycle student, recreational and community. And um, those of us who've been around several decades monitoring these kinds of meetings and struggling to get some uh, extra recognition for the bicycles needs and pedestrian needs, I've uh, been quite frustrated. and. Uh, so, but every time there's a little bit of money proposed for bicycle infrastructure improvement, we are grateful. And, um, but we comment to ourselves things like, well, that's so minimal compared to what the needs are and what could be the priorities. Um, as an example, I've, been, I've done a lot of uh, cycling tours in Western Europe the last couple of decades. And, um, it's amazing what it could be like uh, in a civilization like ours. We were from Copenhagen down through Frankfurt to Marseille. They've got the answer 
full of bicyclists. There's bicycles everywhere. There's bicycle la dedicated lanes everywhere. The drivers respect the bicyclists everywhere in Europe, but not in Anchorage. We're so far behind. I'm almost embarrassed every time I come back from cycling to see what condition the situation is here. And I don't know if any of you are red faced or embarrassed about the lack of bicycle infrastructure in Anchorage. I don't know if I'm not, but perhaps you should be. And I would ask how many of you bike regularly, or bicycle commute regularly either to work or to, to do errands? Yeah. But not commute to work. Summer. Summer. Is it, or, do you feel unsafe? Is it not convenient? The time I live about 40 minutes away on a bike, and to come to work to have to dress up for most of the meetings I come to, I'd have to shower multiple times a day. So those are part of the, the whole, the complete streets picture. Um, if I had a choice, I'd live much closer here. I'm working on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I guess the point is having people decide on these issues when they don't really have a, most of them have a, a detailed knowledge of what the problems and the situations are, but that's, Welcome to my Anyway, um, I'm too in favor of increasing the, the proposal as, as it's supported by several of both in writing and the public testimony here. And uh, I just hope we can, uh, uh, you can iron out your bureaucratic problems of who does what first, well, it wasn't proposed, well, yes, it was, well, we can't consider it, or that has to be the following year, or we'll rock and beat it if they fall. It's all BS as far as we on the ground and on the pavement are concerned. So please do your job and do it effectively for the benefit of the entire community as it's been expressed by the uh, Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That was three more, but is there anybody else who's been inspired to speak before we close? Thank you, everybody. I really do appreciate it. So this item now flies back with me. Yeah. More discussion? More questions? Well, Madam Chair, I'll get the ball rolling. Um, I'll first put a motion on the table here to approve um, Major Amendment 4 uh, as on our proposal, I have some proposed amendments. I have the main motion to approve amendment four. Second. Mr. Weber, second the file. All right. So, um, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. I think uh, um, I think Mr. Uh, the gentleman that spoke first said we haven't had a turnout like this in a while, and uh, maybe we should put the bikes on the agenda more often to have more coverage. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm the director of People Mover Public Transportation, and basically every trip that I provide starts with a bike or a pet. So I'm, I'm very interested in, in um, you know, providing the pedestrian facilities, the maintenance of the facilities. Um, but as a member of this committee, the thing that I want to make sure that we do have the ability to do, whether it's a road project, as um, Bart mentioned, or wh whatever the kind of project is, if we program money into a particular project, and we can't deliver on that project, two things have to happen. One, the money goes outside of Anchorage to another project, but we have to find a, a project inside Anchorage, whether it's a trail project, a bus project, a road project, that we can actually deliver it to. Because that amount of money we get, that's the amount of money we spend. And so we want to make sure that we don't leave anything on the table. So I think Smart and Craig, um, you know they do a great job trying to program where those where those monies have um, where they I think can do the best. So I also recognize that you don't get to add money into the tip on a particular project without taking money away from another project in the tip because there has to be a, a <coughs> and, um, and the total amount of money. So um, as the comments have come in, um, I visited with my staff and I think. Um, I don't think there's a way to get 3.2 million in there, but I have a proposal I'd like to put to the committee that we could probably put some money in there. But before I do that, I need to know from Lori, maybe from, um, actually this really relates to Lori, um, maybe Jerry and Ken and Stephanie. The comments that we heard were all about striping and signage. And 
you know, the ability to deliver a million dollars worth of signing and striping, or two million dollars, or three million dollars, do we have, I mean, can we do that in this federal fiscal year? Can we obligate that amount of money? And if there's disagreement, then maybe we need to set aside and, and figure out how to do that, because um, I'm not about playing catch up. Oh, we need to play catch up in the roads. I need to play a lot of catch up in the bus business. So I, I, I'm not, it's not about catch up to me. It's, it's about being able to do what we can do. So, so maybe I'll start with the staff. Lori, based on the list here, the ability that we could obligate a million or more than a million, I mean, what, what would be your sense based on your knowledge of the ability to do this? I mean, I think based on the test case that we've had so far of the Arctic Boulevard and it's been we're, we're going into the second year and it's costing twice as much I think Mr. Hansen's idea of funding a million for design and then extra the next year for construction is probably the wise way to go so that if we had a million and we could start uh, getting these designed, that would be a way to go, and perhaps we do get a consultant rather than doing it in-house, because that's it's been do being done in-house at DOT, and I think that's part of it. People have a lot of obligations. So, yeah. And, and, Jerry? And, yeah, I, like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm leaning towards would have to, because we've got to do some sort of an environmental document, we've got to, you know, get that written, uh, you go through the approval process, it's not a parallel process. You know, you can't do s step A and step B at the same time in the process. You got to do step A and then you finish that and get on to step B. So it's, it's, it's very time consuming. Um, I don't know that I've got the staff to do any of that. So that means I'm looking at consultants, which means, as I said, I'm looking at you know, having somebody on board April and May. And and I just don't see that we're going to have, get the money out this year to do the actual construction. Now I can see that we can get these things designed, get to the projects, and get them ready. And, and I'm, a, I'm totally in favor of this. It's just get ready for 2014 uh, funding in be ready to go May 15th and just do as much as we've got the money for. And I, and I think in a tip, our, our goal is to actually build something, but when it comes to the programming, the goal is obligation. Yeah. So my question is, can we obligate a million dollars worth of money in the next 10 months? Because that's all we got left in this federal fiscal year. And, and I mean, fully obligation? Left. Well, they have the existing projects are already short. There's some. And then, so you're not going to have a whole million because you're going to have to pay for the yeah. overrun of the other two projects. All right? So <coughs> you're already saying double. So we're already only down to 700000 maybe. Yeah. So you, might, you actually might not be able to do it. You, yeah. might, you might be able to do what you got to get it obligated. But that's about it. It's, 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 it's not, you, you know. Three point two million dollars this year. I I don't see how. And Ken, I'll defer to you too. I would recommend financing a design project funded out of FY thirteen. Not a million dollars, maybe about half of that, five hundred sixty hundred thousand dollars. And using the balance for the following year, recognizing it's a rolling balance. We have a traffic design term agreement that we are nearing completion of the selection process. That's something that we could use to to do the design of this. But I really don't deliver anything for construction funded in 2015. So, so as I read um, major amendment four, it's for two years. And what I'm hearing from this discussion is that we really do need some money for design this year. And then we need construction money for next year. And right now, Major Member 4 is, uh, doesn't include any construction money for the bicycle plan implementation and what I'm also hearing from the people who come here today, they want to see an increase, not just for $1 million, but for up to $3.2 million. So one thing we could do is either go with the $1 million and or maybe reduce it a little bit according to your suggestion for this year, because that's the potentially from the year 
a responsible amount to spend this year, and, but then we need money next year. I would advocate for more than just the remainder of the one million, but to put it to another two million. Um, I recognize that's going to have to come from somewhere, but you know, I think it's possible to figure out a plan to, to come up with where it would come from. Thank you, Jerry. Let the record show that Jennifer Witt had to leave at 4.31 and that Mr. Hansen just left at 4.37. Sorry, Mr. Morton. I would offer up that there will likely be a number of fifth amendments between now and 2014. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's easier to get the money, though, then. No. And I guess one of the things is if, with the million dollars, I mean, you said mentioned something about possibly reducing, but even if we <coughs> if we obligate this million dollars, we leave that in for the next year, even if we don't end up using all of that for that year to consider to continue to design, it can either existing projects, it's not used for that, or develop, it can either be rolled over to the following year or I mean used on other projects. I mean really but that money we, we could find a way to use it. Oh, really? It will get used. Yeah. And I'd rather I'd rather not reduce it. I'd rather have it there just in case of any I mean when projects are doubling in cost. <laughs> I mean and that's that's my, my fear is I know a lot of these signing and striping projects seem simple. Seem simple. And I mean as being a traffic engineer I'm in charge of the signing and striping. I know things that seem simple are often very complicated. <laughs> whether signs actually can find what fall within the right of way, whether we have the poles and then you have the environment. Who would think that signs need an environmental documentation, but depending on where they go, the documentation has to be significant because of the federal process. And I, uh, I just want to make sure that we're covering our bases in, in the upcoming year. I just, just to add to that, um, like Chippo which is the historical group, has to look at where the signs are and if it ruins the view shed, just so people understand. Yeah. And it does add to the, the clutter, and it's something I have to consider in looking at safely right, signing our roadways, not just the bikeways, is, is there too much? Are people going to see the additional signage we're putting up for these bikes so that they can <coughs> identify this is a bike route? and not just seeing all the other signs that we are federally required to have up on our roadways. So there's a lot of considerations that go into it. And safety is the number one priority. Um, just for discussion purposes so you guys understand, um, this money also requires a local match. The community would have to provide 10% uh, funding. We pushed <coughs> two projects out of this year because they couldn't provide the match for $1 million. So if we're adding money to the funding, the community would have to come up with 10% of that money as well. Just FYI. For design as well as construction. Design and construction doesn't matter. Any phase with federal funds is. So, in so we have a ten percent match. Mm -hmm. That's <coughs> if it's on a uh, city right. right if it's right? on a state uh, state right. The state would probably right. cover. <coughs> so what it sounds like, it sounds like two thousand thirteen is the least for TE. Like, that's where I mean it's okay the way it is right now because we. I know the comments aren't happy, but you know, feasibly, feasibility-wise, that we can actually spend it. Um, but the million dollars to thirteen seems to be reasonable. So that's what's what? reasonable. A million and when? Two thousand and thirteen. Now it's two thousand and thirteen. Question is the construction and where that would come from, and possibly illustrate that in the illustrative program adding money uh, also. <coughs> Fifteen. Madam Chair, oh, go ahead. Steve. I was going to say, I think, you know, I think part of what we've got to rec rec come to grips with today is, that, you know, is, is there a commitment to take all these comments seriously and do something about it? And I, and I don't doubt that there will be. It's just now you got to do it in an intelligent way. Because when you're dealing with federal money, I know these things, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and you've got to, you know, you've got to be very deliberate about the process because you waste it, you don't get it back. And to have a plan for dealing with bike paths and, and pedestrian pathways, just like you do for roads, and a vetting process and a, and a prioritization, all of that is about as important as I, it, it can possibly be after all of this. And you're right. I don't own a bike. 
I live farther away than Stephanie does, but I don't own a bike. Uh, but uh, I don't know what I don't know either. And, uh, and perhaps some, some advice and cooperation <coughs> and participation from part of the bike community when it comes to figuring out what are the priorities that we ought to be thinking about uh, because money's tight, you can't get everything you want. But, uh, but with a deliberate process where you can, you, you can commit to someday finishing uh, as, as much as you can get done, you know, that's going to have to be the solution, I think. Yes, uh, I, I certainly second what Steve said and, and in, in the same matter what um, Cindy and Lance was saying. It seems like 2013 were what I would call kind of like a strategic pause with about somewhere between half a million and a million dollars. I'd like to bring this back to what Chris had to say on the phone, though. This is no longer safety movement. This is no longer transportation enhancements. It's alternative transportation. Alternative transportation. There will be a significant difference, and there is a significant difference, between Map 21 and Safety Loop. Um, I think in some cases it's going to be easier. I think Map 21 attempted to do away with some of these onerous environmental documents. At, um, on some of these easier projects, we may find that they're a categorical exclusion, which is simply filling out, if you want, um, a relatively simple process. At the same time, we need to come to an understanding of what MAP 21 means from the philosophical standpoint on some of these programs. Uh, so I, I, I like the idea of kind of taking a pause here. I know you guys want a whole bunch of money. We support that. Uh, I'm a railroad guy. I support bike paths away from the railroad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But um, at, at the same time, um, many, many, many years ago, sitting at this committee, when we were trying to propose a number of different capital extensions of the program, I would have preferred to see us complete the network that we have now. So I think, you know, going back to Steve's comments about help from the bike community, Lori did a wonderful job on getting some of that priority established. But at the same time, I think we need to take a little bit of pause here, and maybe, maybe this is the year to do it, and then move forward with some additional funding in the future years. My concern as a member of the committee for a number of years now is that we rhetorically express support for bike plan development and implementation, pedestrian plan development and implementation, and we haven't been able to deliver on that. We haven't been able to commit the funds. Um, what I'm hearing is that there's maybe now a newfound commitment, and I would suggest that, you know, having the opportunity right now to actually increase the funds to make a change uh, other than our business as usual and, and zero out money for 2014 and, and pass what we've already decided is going to go into 2013, maybe we can change that. Maybe we can uh, increase that because we know we're going to have to move from design to construction eventually. So I would support an extra $2 million in 2014 uh, be devoted uh, in the in the, uh, as an amendment to the TIP major amendment. Is that a motion? Uh, well, I think we're in a motion right now, so. We're on a main motion there. Yeah. yeah. We can amend, make a right. motion to amend. Okay, I can make an, a motion to amend uh, TIP major amendment four to add $2 million to uh, 2014 for bicycle plan project implementation. I think that may take some time to figure that out, but I am not recommending right now where it's coming from. But we, we have to work together and figure that out. Well, I'll second the motion, but if the, if the, if the mover will perhaps amend it to say, let staff come back to us with some recommendations That's about where the $2 million is coming from. Thank you. And, and maybe uh, maybe this would it, it, yeah. there's too much piling on, but <laughs> my guess is you you can only construct that which you've permitted and designed. So you, you don't want any more money there than you can say you've got a, a permit to construct and a design to construct too. Is that safe to say? 
I would say by 2014, we should have a really good idea. We need to make amendments. We can't. Can I revise my motion? Uh, I will revise my motion to uh, uh, move to add two million dollars to uh, bicycle plan project implementation in 2014, and would like to see staff come back to us with a recommendation where that would come from. Second. So where does that fit the timeline to give staff to come back with a recommendation? Well, <coughs> Craig said we're not in a huge rush. Right. Every day that goes on is another day that's going to take before we can request design funding. We're burning up to 2013 clock, sitting at this table. One more thing. I'm very sympathetic with Lois' motion. I think that uh, what, what I'd rather see the motion phrased is I'd like to see what it looks like when we add $2 million to 2014 in terms of the program as a whole. And if it seems reasonable, I would like to support it. But I don't want to. I don't want to support right now saying $2 million for 2014 without seeing what, the, what we're going to lose from, from other programs. But I, I'm very sensitive. I think that I heard this, and I, being a cyclist myself, know there are barriers to getting around town. You can't, I, mean, I will not go to some places in town just because I know it's so dangerous. But, um, and I see the need for it, but I know that there's limited funds, and I want to see what the trade-offs are before I can support something like that. I have a question. Ken, maybe you can help me with this one. Um, if, there, if we were over-programmed, or Bart, if we were over-programmed in 2013 and we, we obligated in 2013, would we be able to carry that money into 14 at all? Yeah, once you obligate, that money sticks with the project throughout however many years it takes. It's just getting ready enough to obligate those, those funds. And you have to have a, 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 a good estimate to go with that. You have to have a, a schedule and an estimate to go with it. So if you have that, you can obligate, that money sticks with it. So we know that 2013 is an issue because Dowling is underfunded $3 million and we're hoping that DOBs take over. And your best guess for 2014, is there going to be an underfunding problem in, a, in 2014? Or do you think we, we, we may have some deobligations or whatnot that could be applied later? I mean, it's not like we have a hole this, in this year, but next year, do we, are we running into that same kind of an issue? Here, here's the problem with that, is we're planning to borrow money from 2014 to fund Dowling Road in 2013. So therefore, that money won't be there. You won't be able to take the money from Dowling in 2014 anymore. There is nothing else in the program because that's taking up the whole increment allocation right now. There's only a million dollars that you could take from O'Malley and that would not allow us to complete the right-of-way phase. Actually, we're planning to borrow that money into 2013 as well. So you would have to make that decision now, and it would just affect how much we borrowed and that whole, we, it would, may affect the obligation date. We would not be able to obligate by 2013. So under Map 21, the amount of federal transit money that's coming to Anchorage um, is about the same, but a little bit more. And I think this project in itself, we would be able to support with FTA dollars rather than CMAC dollars. So what I would suggest is a million dollars in third, what I was thinking about was the million dollars in that project in 2013 for CMAC could go towards the bike plan implementation, assuming we could implement it. Simply, we could obligate it, and that's the that's the that's the thing I need to be convinced we can. Do. Um, and I think Ken's comment is I don't know. Um, and the other thing is the match. If you put two million dollars in there and you don't match it, it's gone. It's gone. And so you know that's a question that 
I need I think we need to get resolved before we actually commit it. Um, and I think as as Ken mentioned, every so it goes by. So. <clears throat> So once you put the transit, then maybe in the head plan, if the pedestrian plan could be implemented, and then move the one million thousand fourteen in the head plan up one to the five plan. Maybe not the same thing. I don't know, Lori. Do you understand that? I, do. I think so. I, I think. The, the well, question is, you take the CMAC money for the transit facilities. unless they're within the roadway. Likewise, for the bicycle plan, we can use road bond funds because it's an on-road. So I, I see sources. For the match? Yes. Okay. But if we were to do this little show me thing, could you get a million dollars in bicycle improvement or design? And they could get a million pedestrian projects designed all in the same year. I believe so. So then we could take the million dollars that's currently identified in the head plan and move it up to the bicycle. You at least got another million in the bicycle plan for 2014 without robbing anybody yet, really. Well, I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't have an alternative solution. <laughs> 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 well, well, we looked at it. There's a million without, without too much of a problem. Mm -hmm. I think I'd have a tough time spending a million dollars in design in FY13. Obligating you think so? Another, another million? Okay. It would not be difficult to take that million dollars in transit in 2013 and move it to 2014. We would just adjust the borrowing amount for Dowling in those two years. Okay. So you could put that million dollars anywhere in 2014, and we can adjust it with Dowling. That's the great thing about AC over two years. So, so we could take the 2000, that's why I asked earlier, if you put it in one year, can you spend it in another Oh, right, year? yeah. If you want to take that 2013 money that's in there and move it to 2014 in the tip, we can do that. And for obligate, the bike plan? In the, for the bike plan. Okay. And still keep the stuff in the... 2014. Right, so what? just so I understand what you're saying, right now we have a million dollars in the bike plan for 2013. Yes. We have a million dollars in the transit program for 2013. Yes. We're going to move that million dollars into 2014 for the bike plan, so it'll be a million dollars in 2013, a million dollars in 2014. Yes. We can do that and we'll just adjust the numbers for Dowling to make, we'll reduce Dowling by a million dollars in 2013. To borrow. To borrow, yeah, so. All right, so I'm not done. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to make a, I'll, I'll move. Uh, well, she's no, she's sorry. Oh, we're the sorry. You withdraw the motion. Okay. The second support the withdrawal. Somebody. I'll help you out. Thank you. Oh, I'll <laughs> agree. So I'm going to move, I'm going to move that we take the um, project number, the money in the transit center uh, facilities under CMAC for a million dollars. Project number two, and move it to 2014 for the bike plan implementation. Second. Moved by Ms. Riller, seconded by Ms. Miles. Are there any opposed? Just hearing that we're approved. Oh, so that just amendment. Thank you. We've gone back to the original. <laughs> 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 you got it, but you didn't get it. So, yeah. um, <laughs> I would also recommend that um, under project one, which is transit facilities expansion, replacement, and operations. Yes, please. Project number one, which is uh, the project, we could probably take, I think, about Three hundred thousand dollars of that two million, and move it into fourteen under bike plan implementation. And the reason I say that is, we, based on the success that uh, Jamie had in writing the state of good repair grant, we're not going to need as much money to replace our fleet um, from the tip. 
because Just we got point of order, Lance. You talking about 2012 to 2014? <laughs> I'm sorry. 2014. I have two million dollars in 14. Take 300 grand of that two million and move it to the bike plan in 2014. In addition. So that's my motion. Second. Thank you. And the reason I think we can do that now is two reasons. One, I don't think we'll need that much money in 14 for our fleet replacement. However, um, I may need that money, and I think depending on the rules for MAP 21, I'm going to be looking to this program dollars to maybe even support our operations in, in transit. So uh, I'm very sensitive to what we could do with these funds in the future. So I don't want to take um, I don't want to take more of it than that. So. Um, and I think I think it's okay for transit, and um, so if I could get a support of that. Nice. We have a motion by Mr. Rivers, by Ms. Hall. Do we have any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So that's a million in 2013 and a million three in 2014. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So my next motion is what I'd like to do is take project number two that's in the CMAC program, which is transit center support facilities. Still got time? Which one? Project number two. The one I took a million away from. I want to move that project to table seven. Because I, I want to keep the project alive, but I want to fund it with FTA. So I just ask that we and I'm not I'm not changing the scope. Um, I just want to move it to table seven and you know create it, put it at the bottom, which would be a new project ten. Same amount. Um, Same amount. Um, well, there's nothing in it right now. There will be no money in there. Okay. So. Thank you. Anyone follow me? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. So, um, <laughs> I'm just trying to get it done. Are there any opposed to the motion? Okay. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I, I could work with I could work with staff to do the math, but I'll, I'll express it to the committee as a whole. The numbers that we have in 2013 and 2014, based on the information I got from staff, the 5307 amount is going to be 6.9 million dollars. That's reflected in here. 6.9. Does that make sense? Table seven. Bart, you cracking with me? Table seven. We're getting there. The 5307 money we're getting as a matter of Act 21 is $6.9 million. So that requires a match. If you add the match, the total will be $8.6 million. So the numbers that are reflected in Table 7 are only the federal share. They don't include the match. So here's the match. Project number, I'm going to make this all in one motion. In 2013, I want to change the dollar amount for project one to 4340000 million. In what, in what year? 13. 480 in the next one. 700000 in project number three. 750000 in number six. Number seven, eight, and nine stay the same. And then the new project that we move from table five to table seven, make it one million eight hundred and forty thousand. And that should get you the eight million six hundred thousand dollars. The math is right. I can repeat it. I think it's forty one forty three forty. I tell you what, Madam Chair, if you if you trust me, I have to add right. I'm not moving it around. I'm just adding the project. I'll give it the credit. Thank you. At the end of the day, we'll be balanced. Are there any opposed to the motion? Just a point of order, just a discussion. Uh, Lance, I, I, I appreciate your exuberance, but if you're going to change one year to include the match, you're you're on a slippery slope to start changing and reflect so the public has a full 
I, so we have full transparency. I, so I, just be I, careful. I bring you, uh, Greg brought it up because I passed Craig a note and I wanted to make sure that all of the tables in the tip include the match. Okay. Table seven doesn't include the match. So I just want to make sure that table seven is the same as everything else in the match. Because I don't know how many times I question my staff to make sure it's the case. So um, and I, I will make apple staff well, with exuberance. <laughs> <laughs> so Sorry, that's all I have, Master. No, I withdraw the point of order. Okay. okay. So, we're close. All right, so we, we still have order. I know, we're beyond our time. We're close. We are. Well, no, it's 502. I mean, and we do have the final motion ahead of us. <coughs> the motion was to approve this. That has amended. Approved it, yeah. Was approved it. Amendment mm -hmm. 4 has amended. So, these three, do you want to finalize the motion or continue? Finalize. Finalize. All right. So, the original motion, you made the original motion, yes. Approve this right here. So, the motion before us is to. For to approve this amendment as amended? Yes. <laughs> with all the amendments. Yes. <laughs> the amended amendment with the amendments. Yes. All right. Are there any opposed to the amendments? Are there any none? So we adjourn. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's 5.03 p.m.